from Space Launch Complex 37 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Base. This is Launch United Launch Alliance presents live Delta IV launch coverage. On board the Delta IV today, WGS-5, the fifth wideband global SATCOM system mission for the United States Air Force. Range, go for launch. Roger, go for launch. T-minus three, two, one. Atlas engine ignition. Lift off of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV heavy rocket. This is Delta Mission Control at T minus four minutes in holding. Launch countdown is currently in a planned 45 minute hold. This hold is designed to allow launch conductor Doug LeBeau and his team time to conduct final work be countdown before countdown resumes. However, at this time the team is, is not working any issues. Our 30 minute launch window this evening opens at 8.27 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Good evening and welcome to Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. I'm Howard Voyant and I will be your commentator for tonight's launch. Following liftoff, we'll have Steve Agid will be providing launch ascent data. Later in the broadcast, I'll be joined by Colonel David Goldstein from the Air Force Space and Missile System Center. Colonel Goldstein is the Deputy Director of the Military Satellite Communications Systems Directorate. His organization is responsible for all Air Force communication satellite acquisitions. As I mentioned, WHS-5 is the fifth satellite in the wideband global SATCOM system. Built by Boeing Space and Intelligence Systems, WGS is an important element of the new high-capacity satellite communication system providing enhanced communication capabilities to the U.S. and Allied warfighters for the next decade and beyond. Each WGS satellite provides more wideband communications capacity than the entire defense satellite communications system the constellation WGS is augmenting. The launch, team, the launch team recently received the final weather briefing and was told that weather was in the, the launch commitment criteria for this evening's liftoff. So we are proceeding towards liftoff with a planned T0 of 8.27 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. ULA is using the Delta IV Medium Plus 5-4 configuration to launch the WGS-5 mission. This is the 22nd Delta IV Evolved Expendable Launch Vehicle mission since the inaugural flight in 2002 and the third flight of the Medium Plus 5-4. The Delta IV is produced in Decatur, Alabama and is comprised of a common booster core powered by the Pratt & Whitney Rocketdyne RS-68 engine four Alliant Tech Systems solid rocket motors and a Delta Cryogenic second stage powered by the Pratt & Whitney Rocketdyne RL-10B engine. The WS satellite is encapsulated in a five meter diameter payload fairing which occurred on April 25th. The encapsulated payload fairing was transported to Space Launch Complex 37 and mated to the Delta IV launch vehicle on May 7th. In preparation for launch, the Mobile Service Tower, or MST, is rolled back, revealing the Delta IV launch vehicle. The 33-story MST weighs over 9 million pounds and is rolled to its launch position 300 feet north of the Delta IV launch vehicle. The Delta IV stands 217 feet tall or about 20 stories and weighs approximately 900,000 pounds fully fueled. It delivers nearly a million pounds of thrust off the launch pad. 
For those watching the broadcast, you're looking at video taken yesterday at Space Launch Complex 37 as final launch preparations were completed. This is Delta Mission Control at T-4 and holding, and we continue to progress towards a launch at 8.27 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The animation you'll see after liftoff is referred to as Satellite Toolkit, or STK. STK uses real-time telemetry data during the flight to track the path of the launch vehicle beyond the range of the ground-based cameras. While the team completes final preparations, let's take a closer look at tonight's flight. The following profile details the important events of this mission using approximate times. The Delta IV rocket will launch a WGS, or Wideband Global SATCOM satellite, for the U.S. Air Force. Five, four, three, two, one, zero, plus one, lift off. The Delta RS-68 main engine and four strap-on solid rocket motors ignite to lift the vehicle away from the pad. Shortly after liftoff, the Delta begins its initial pitch and yaw maneuvers to attain the proper ascent profile and minimize aerodynamic loads. Delta IV reaches Mach 1, the speed of sound, at 36 seconds. At 50 seconds, the vehicle reaches maximum dynamic pressure. The strap-on solid rocket motors, or SRMs, burn out approximately 94 seconds into flight. At 1 minute 40 seconds, the first two SRMs are jettisoned. Two seconds later, the remaining two solid rocket motors are jettisoned. At 240 seconds into the flight, the RS-68 engine initiates throttle down to 57%. Approximately seven seconds before booster engine cutoff, the RS-68 reaches MPL, or minimum power level. The payload fairing is jettisoned at three minutes, 27 seconds. Approaching main engine cutoff, the Delta IV is burning propellant at a rate of approximately 151 pounds per second, flying at more than 109 miles in altitude and 237 miles downrange. Main engine cutoff occurs just over four minutes into the flight. After main engine cutoff, the first stage is jettisoned. Second stage engine ignition takes place at 4 minutes 27 seconds into the flight. The second stage and WGS satellite are now in the first burn, the longer of the two second stage engine firings. Following the first second stage engine cutoff at approximately 20 minutes, the mission enters a coast phase. Just over 28 minutes into flight, the second stage engine is reignited for the second and final burn. Following the second stage engine cutoff, the second stage and payload enter a coast period in preparation for spacecraft separation. At 40 minutes into the mission, the second stage releases wideband global SATCOM satellite for the United States Air Force. This is Delta Mission Control at T minus four minutes in holding. Tonight's launch is dedicated in memory of ULA employee Tim Hodgins. As a quality inspector for the launch operations team, Tim was responsible for verifying flight hardware compliance with engineering and test standards, as well as the corresponding documentation, maintenance, and inspection records. Prior to his 10-year career with ULA, Tim served 14 years in Army aviation as a member of a Black Hawk helicopter flight crew where he saw combat duty in the Gulf War and Somalia. Tim was a proud father and an inspiring teammate. His co-workers will remember his homemade barbecue, uncanny sense of humor, and the professionalism and dedication he brought to his job each day. L minus 10 minutes. All communications switch to channel one. All personnel and visitors remain in present position until launch. Maintain operational silence in the LCC. This is LC with a terminal count briefing. If a condition exceeds a launch constraint any time after the terminal count status check, the observer shall announce hold, hold, hold on channel one, identify their station, and briefly state the reason for the hold.
LCFMA primary wind load relief file has been loaded into Rivka and verified. Checksum is 6 Echo 98. Roger. This is Delta Mission Control at T minus four minutes in holding. We remain in the planned 45 minute built in hold as preparations for launch continue. Launch conductor Doug LeBeau will pull the team in a few moments for the final go to resume the Delta IV launch countdown. 31 engineers and managers will be polled for system status and readiness to proceed with the launch. This is the final status check before launch of all Delta vehicle systems, ground systems, the spacecraft, and the U.S. Air Force Eastern Range. The vehicle systems readiness poll includes electrical systems, hydraulics, pneumatics, propulsion systems, flight control, and propellants. Final processing steps just prior to launch include completing propellant topping for both vehicle stages, securing propellant tanks, and pressurizing tanks to flight pressures. Let's listen to Doug LeBeau perform the final polling for, of the launch team. L minus seven minutes. Status check to proceed with terminal count. MEQ? Go. MEA? Go. HYE? Go. LOX1? Go. LOX2? Go. VP? Go. PNE? Go. VP? Go. ATC1? Go. PEA? Go. Fuel1? Go. Fuel2? Go. TM1? Go. ATC3? Go. TM2? Go. FMA? Go. VE? Go. EEA? Go. GE? Go. SYS? Go. DSE? Go. Timer? Go. ECS? Go. SC? Go. QE? Go. OSM? Go. VSC? VSC is go. ALC? Go. AC? AC is go. RC? Range, weather, and clear to proceed. LD? MD, the launch vehicle is ready to launch. MD? Yeah, permission to launch. Proceeding with the count. MEQ, establish swing arm lock pins pull. Active. SY, establish record on change list activated. Activated. L minus six minutes. Polling is complete and the launch team has given the go for launch. The countdown will resume at T minus four minutes in approximately two minutes. At T minus four minutes, the countdown, the counting, the team will enter the terminal count and will begin securing the second stage liquid oxygen tank. At T minus three minutes, 32 seconds, CBC liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen tank securing is started, which includes closing the propellant fill and drain valves. Also at T minus three minutes, 32 seconds, vehicle transfer from ground facility power to its own internal battery power will be complete. At T minus three minutes, the vehicle ordnance system will be armed and the CBC liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen propellant tanks are verified to be at flight pressure and flight level. At two minutes prior to liftoff, the team will, will verify that the hydraulic system is pressurized as well as confirm CBC, DCSS, and FTS battery voltages. At one minute and 20 seconds, the team will begin securing the second stage liquid hydrogen tank. At T minus 60 seconds, the eastern range readiness is verified. At T minus 50 seconds, the DCSS liquid hydrogen tank is secured at flight level. At T minus 15 seconds, the ROFIs or sparklers are ignited to burn off excess hydrogen. Liftoff will occur at T zero. T minus four minutes and counting. Upper stage lock securing started. Vehicle transferring internal. 
This is Delta minutes. Mission Control at T minus four and holding. We anticipate picking up the launch count in just a few moments. The countdown clock has resumed and we are go for launch at 8.27 p.m. Eastern. Carry started. Vehicle transfer internal complete. CBC lock secured. T minus three minutes, 14 seconds. Second phase lock right. secured at white level. CBC pre press started. T minus three minutes, seven seconds. CPC LH2 secured. T minus three minutes. Vehicle ordinance army. CBC press purges on. Vehicle ordinance arm. Hmm? CBC lock secure at flight pressure and flight level. T minus two minutes and 30 seconds in counting. The countdown is on track as we proceed towards T zero. Minus two minutes. EPA script early. Hydraulic press at 4,000. CBC LH2 at flight pressure and flight level. T minus one minute, 30 T seconds. T minus 90 seconds in the launch vehicle, payload, ground systems, and eastern range are go for launch. T minus one minute, 20 seconds. Upper stage LH2 securing started. T minus, T minus one, minute. one minute and counting. Rock report range status. Range green. Agents of Starbucks, go. T minus 50 seconds. Minus 45. Launch enable, enable. Manpower e. off. Minus 40. Second stage LH2 secure at flight level. Minus 30. T minus that 30 is seconds. Go Go Green WGS. board. Green board. Minus 25. Light locking. Minus 22. Sir, I'm TVC blowdown. Minus 15. Rough ignition. T minus 10. T minus 10. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. We have lift off. We have RS 27 main engine. We have liftoff, the United Launch Alliance Delta IV rocket carrying WGS-5 for the United States Air Force. The wideband global SATCOM satellite provides significantly increased capacity to our nation's leaders, warfighters, and international partners. Looking good. You are hearing the, the voice of Steve Agid providing launch vehicle ascent data. Passing 36 seconds, Mach 1. Vehicle now going transonic. Chamber pressure is holding good in the first stage. Solid motor chamber pressure beginning to drop off as expected. Passing 50 seconds, max Q. Maximum dynamic pressure in the vehicle. Coming up on the one minute mark. Mark, one minute. Velocity passing 1300 miles per hour. One minute, 10 seconds into the flight. Good chamber pressure holding on the first stage. Passing one minute, 15 seconds. 
Marine supply valve is now open in the second stage. Standing by for a solid rocket motor burnout about 10 seconds from now. And burnout, standing by for SEP. And we have separation. Separation of the solid rocket motors. One minute, 47 seconds into the flight, the Delta vehicle now only weighs one half of what it did at launch, one minute, 52 seconds ago, expelling propellant at 1,850 pounds per second. Coming up on the two-minute mark. Mark, two minutes. Still looking good. Now, two minutes, 10 seconds into the flight, vehicle now traveling at Mach 5, five times the speed of sound. C5. That's in the area of maximum fairing skin temperature. Chamber pressure right where we want it to be on the first stage. Coming up two minutes, 50 seconds into the flight, still looking good. Velocity now passing 9,100 feet per second, altitude 53.6 nautical miles, downrange distance 84.8 nautical miles. I think three minutes, seven seconds. Mark 10 seconds, Mach 10. Vehicle now going 10 times the speed of sound. Oh well. Separation. Fairing separation looks good. Hmm. Coming up three minutes, 50 seconds. Our events are occurring very close to their expected times. Passing the four minute mark. Partial thrust demand. We have Miko, main engine has cut off. Standing by for stage sep, stage separation. Have Nets is deploying. Standing by for igniter spark. Igniter spark. And we have ignition. Ignition on the second stage. Second stage chamber pressure rising. Good chamber pressure, right where we want it to be. This, this is Delta Mission Control at T plus 4 minutes and 51 seconds. We've just heard Steve Agad report the successful execution of events comprising the early portion of the evening's mission. The mission is now in the first of two planned RL-10 second stage, second stage engine burns and all systems continue to operate nominally. This burn will last approximately 16 minutes. I am now joined by Colonel David Goldstein from the Air Force's Military Satellite Communication Systems Directorate. Colonel Goldstein, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Howard. It's a pleasure to be here for the fifth WGS launch. Colonel Goldstein, as we've seen, just seen a spectacular liftoff of the Delta IV rocket, how does it feel seeing the fifth WGS satellite on the way to orbit? It's a great feeling to see the launch of the fifth satellite, especially knowing how important this constellation is to our servicemen and women deployed around the world. Of course, the real work for our team is just beginning. Following separation from the Delta IV launch vehicle approximately 35 minutes from now, our team will continue orbit raising over the next 106 days. After another 49 days of rigorous testing by Boeing and the Army, because Army Strategic Command actually operates the payload, our team will reposition WGS-5 from the test orbit to the operational orbit over another 24 days. So you can see from this timeline, there are still several months of hard work to do before the satellite is ready for operations. 
As I mentioned earlier, the WGS system provides an important increase in, in capacity over the legacy system. Could you explain what that means to our troops in the field? Sure. In order to illustrate that point, I'd like to discuss a few key capabilities of the WGS system and how it's a significant upgrade to its predecessor. First, WGS is the only military satellite communication system that can support simultaneously X and KA band communications with cross-banding to make communicating across terminal types transparent to the users. WGS currently collects and routes real-time data through the X band, KA band, and switchable X KA band terminals being used for strategic, tactical, and calm on the move, on the move communications. Each WGS satellite has such data capacity that WGS also performs the Global Broadcast Service mission, known as GBS. GBS is like DirecTV for our warfighters using KA band. Finally, WGS satellites are built to communicate with Airborne Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance, or ISR systems, by KA band. This capability provides the critical bandwidth necessary to communicate with multiple remotely piloted aircraft while simultaneously providing services to many other users. The WGS satellite must be quite advanced to be such a game changer for the Department of Defense. Would you describe some of the unique features of the satellite? Howard, just to put it in perspective, one WGS satellite has the equivalent capacity of the entire legacy system. These satellites provide an increased number of users' voice, data, and commanding at about 10 times the data rate previously available. Our user community consists of national leaders, ground and naval forces, embassies, and airborne ISR assets from the U.S. and our international partners. WGS enables more users to receive more information faster, giving us an advantage over our adversaries. This is the fifth WGS satellite. How will this satellite support the current constellation? The fifth satellite is the second of three in the Block 2 purchase. The final Block 2 satellite, WGS-6, will be launched later this summer. Another four satellites, WGS-7 through 10, are in production or will begin production soon. It's important to note that WGS Block 2 incorporates important technical changes from Block 1. These changes were based on feedback we received from our users. These improvements include a change to our KA antennas as well as RF bypass capability to support users requiring larger amounts of instantaneous bandwidth. In partnership with the Australian Defense Force, we contracted for the sixth satellite. In similar fashion, we partnered with Canada, Denmark, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and New Zealand to contract for the ninth WGS satellite. As vital U.S. allies and in exchange for their support, our partners will receive a proportional share of WGS resources. As you might infer from the number of satellites in production and on contract, wideband communications are in very high demand. Satellite communications is a critical capability for our nation's leaders and our men and women deployed around the world. WGS will provide that capability for the next couple of decades. WGS is the only high data rate communication satellite the Department of Defense operates. It provides the primary DOD link to ground and airborne forces, as well as to U.S. embassies and other authorized users. Very soon, WGS-5 will join WGS-1, 2, 3, and 4 in supporting our troops. Once operational, the WGS Constellation will provide near worldwide coverage. This is achieved because WGS-5 will be positioned to provide coverage to key missions within the continental United States. With WGS-5, a truly global operational capability will be achieved. In fact, with the addition of WGS-5, the final acquisition milestone for the program will be accomplished. Full Operational Capability, or FOC. With this additional KA band and a tremendous increase in X band, services will be provided around the globe to ensure no disruption to the mission. This is an extremely exciting time for the United States and our international partners. So WGS-5 seems like a big step forward for the maturity of the WGS constellation. That's correct, Howard. Declaring WGS full operational capability is a big milestone for Air Force Space Command, the Air Force, and our nation. Well, thank you, Colonel Goldstein. That's great information. I appreciate you giving us a glimpse into the wideband system. Now, let's check back with today's mission. Next major event is the uh, commanding of the uh, command receiver decoders to the off mode. It'll occur shortly. This is Delta Mission Control at T plus 11 minutes, 39 seconds, into the Delta IV WGS 
5 mission. We are currently in the first of two planned RL-10 second stage engine burns and the mission continues nominally. Our next event, second stage engine cutoff or SECO-1, is scheduled to take place in just about eight minutes from now. While we, want, while we wait for our next mission event, let's take a look at a video highlighting the key capabilities we discussed. Success on today's battlefield demands information dominance. To enhance anywhere, anytime communication connections for the warfighter, the wideband global SATCOM system, WGS, is taking the high ground. Hold on three seconds. In a constellation of geostationary satellites, WGS will provide unprecedented capacity, coverage, and connectivity by delivering broadcast, multicast, and point-to-point -point connections. This system meets the flexibility and high capacity requirements of the DOD. WGS collects and routes real-time data between all theaters of operation. Longitude, latitude, or terrain no longer limit a soldier's access to mission support. Riding aboard an Air Force EELV and powered by the Boeing 702 spacecraft bus, each WGS satellite carries more capacity than the entire Discus constellation. WGS leverages decades of industry-leading space-proven technologies. A digital channelizer and reconfigurable antennas allow 19 separate coverage areas, connecting KA and X-band users anywhere within the satellite's field of view. Digital signal processors and advanced phased array antennas enable shaped, steerable spot beams that apply bandwidth exactly where and when the warfighter needs it. High volume uplink and downlink networking of tactical command and control, C4 ISR, and battlefield management allows combatant commanders the flexibility to prioritize tasks and direct critical resources anywhere on the planet. Armed with mission unique command and control software, wideband SATCOM operation centers will keep the constellation on track and on target. Compatible with legacy systems, WGS will augment and then replace the Navy's global broadcast services, becoming a critical node in the military's transformational communications architecture. To meet tomorrow's increasing SATCOM bandwidth requirements, WGS Block 2 satellites will carry RF bypass capabilities, supporting the ultra-wide terminals needed for improved airborne surveillance, intelligence, and reconnaissance. The mission, enhanced global connectivity, increased situational awareness, and instant delivery of critical information to the warfighter. The technology, the Boeing-built wideband global SATCOM system, WGS. The industry's best, proudly supporting our nation's best. The most important theater of operation, anywhere U.S. and coalition forces are deployed, taking the high ground. WGS connects them all. One three, right up. This is Delta Mission Control at T plus 16 minutes 47 seconds into the Delta 4 WGS 5 mission. 
We are approximately three minutes away from the first cutoff of the RL-10 second stage engine, and the mission is progressing as planned. Let's go back to Steve Agate for flight commentary. Altitude now 142.7 nautical miles, velocity 24,992 feet per second, downrange distance 2,405 nautical miles. Seventeen minutes, thirty four seconds in, about three minutes remaining in the burn. Chamber pressure holding very well in the second stage. But engine control in the second stage as we're approaching the eighteen minute mark. Mark eighteen minutes into the flight. Altitude now 125 nautical miles, velocity 26,143 feet per second, downrange distance 2,623 nautical miles. Coming up on 18 minutes, 34 seconds, about uh, two minutes remaining in this first burn. Chamber pressure continues to hold. Good engine control. Passing 19 minutes now. Still looking good. Altitude now 110 nautical miles, velocity 27,490 feet per second, downrange distance 2,888 nautical miles. Nineteen minutes, thirty-four seconds in, about one minute remaining in this burn. Chamber pressure continuing to hold. Good engine control. As we're passing the twenty minute mark. Mark twenty minutes into the flight. Altitude 103 nautical miles, velocity 28,693 feet per second, downrange distance 3,110 nautical miles. Standing by for Miko, correction, uh, Seiko, standing by. And we have Seco. The second burn will occur about seven and a half minutes from now. This is Delta Mission Control at T plus 21 minutes and four seconds. Steve Agate just confirmed cutoff of the RL-10 second stage engine. The WGS-5 mission is now on the on a coast phase off the west coast of Africa. This coast phase will last just under eight minutes, at which time the RL-10 engine will be restarted for the second and the final burn. Let's go back to Steve Agate for mission progress. About 21 minutes, 55 seconds into the flight. Our preliminary uh, orbit numbers for SECA-1 look very good. Now,
now 22 minutes, 25 seconds into the flight. Less than six minutes now until the second burn. Delta flight commentary at uh, 23 minutes, 20 seconds into the flight. Altitude now 117.66 nautical miles. Velocity 29,460 feet per second. Downrange distance 4,007 nautical miles. Our second burn of the uh, second stage engine will occur less than five minutes from now. It's a fairly short burn. Duration just short after uh, just uh, shortly above three minutes in length. Delta flight commentary at 25 minutes into the flight, about uh, three and a half minutes remaining until our second burn of the second stage engine. Flight commentary at uh, 26 minutes into the flight. Still looking good. About uh, two and a half minutes remain until the start of the second burn of the second stage. Attitude control jets at 10 and 12, uh, settling jets are on right now. Less than two minutes till the start of the burn. Twenty-seven minutes into the flight. Next burn to begin less than 90 seconds from now. We've changed the uh, settling pair to uh, ACS jets 9 and 11.
is Delta Flight Commentary coming up on 27 minutes, 50 seconds into the flight. Mark, less than one minute now until the second burn of the second stage. This burn is uh, fairly short in duration, just over three minutes. Expecting to start about 20 seconds from now. Standing by for the burn. And we have the igniter spark. And we have ignition. Ignition on the second stage. Chamber pressure rising. Good chamber pressure in the second stage. Good and stable. Good engine control. This is Delta Mission Control at T plus 29 minutes and 4 seconds. As just reported, the RL-10 engine has been restarted. This second burn will last just over 3 minutes. Our next event, SECO-2, completes the engine burns for this mission. Here again is Steve Agid. 29 minutes, 22 seconds in. Burn continues to look well. Chamber pressure is holding. Good engine control. Twenty-nine minutes, fifty seconds in. Burn continues to look good. T band beacon has been commanded off. About a minute and a half remaining in this burn. Engine control continues to hold. Altitude increasing now, 355 nautical miles, velocity 31,080 feet per second, downrange distance 5,802 nautical miles. Less than uh, 45 seconds now until uh, SECO 2. Thirty seconds remaining now in the burn. Chamber pressure holding very well, good engine control. We have SECO. The emers are locked. We just heard, heard confirmation of the successful cutoff of the RL-10 engine. The mission is now in a nine-minute coast phase, flying above the southwest coast of Africa. WGS-5 separation will occur at, at the conclusion of this coast, at just over 40 minutes after liftoff. I'm joined again by Colonel David Goldstein of the Military Satellite Communication Systems Directorate. Colonel Goldstein, what role does the WGS program play in the overall Air Force po portfolio? As a program, WGS is part of the Military Satellite Communications, or MILSATCOM, Systems Directorate. MILSATCOM provides satellite communications and control to DOD and government users. Our mission is to acquire and maintain these capabilities with ever-increasing capacity, affordability, and acquisition efficiency. 
All most SATCOM programs within the Air Force are developed and managed for the Air Force Space Command by the MILSATCOM Systems Directorate. For our viewers that may not have a grasp on satellite communication, could you explain how it works? E each WGS satellite has a wide field of view of the Earth. The satellite can receive and transmit communication signals within acceptable frequency bands anywhere in that field of view. Because GPS has, because uh, WGS has a fairly large field of view, we are able to provide 24 hour a day, seven day a week communications to warfighters over a significant portion of the globe with just four vehicles. The fifth vehicle will satisfy more of the warfighter demand for wideband SATCOM capability while providing coverage over areas of the Earth not currently covered or needing additional bandwidth. Colonel Goldstein, you're the Deputy Director of the Military Satellite Communication Systems Directorate. Could you explain your role? Sure. I'm just one very small piece of an outstanding team of professionals. As Deputy Director of the MILSATCOM Systems Directorate, I help direct the acquisition, planning, programming, budgeting, and operational support to the $40 billion portfolio of military satellite communication programs. WGS has been one of those programs I hold close to my heart and consider myself extremely lucky to be a part of its, of its successful mission. To sum it all up, we develop, acquire, deploy, and sustain space-enabled, war-winning global communications to support national objectives. It sounds like a challenging position. Could you explain, give us a little background of your career for the younger viewers who might as aspire for such a role? Sure, Howard. Every assignment I've had has prepared me for the position I'm in today. It all started back at the United States Air Force Academy where I graduated in 1988. At the Academy, I learned the basic building blocks of leadership and I took my first astronautics course. From that point on, I was fascinated with satellites, orbits, and space. My kids tell me that's pretty geeky, but I, I just really can't help it. Unfortunately, the Air Force placed me, fortunately, the Air Force placed me in positions throughout my career in an area that I enjoyed working. I started in the Air Force as a second lieutenant, launching old Minuteman missiles at Vandenberg Air Force Base testing reentry systems. I then transferred to the NASA Johnson Space Center, where I worked integrating Department of Defense experiments onto the shuttle. Then I went back to the Air Force Academy to teach astronautics, then to graduate school in a variety of satellite and launch positions, leading to where I am today. The Air Force has definitely given me incredible opportunities through my 25-year career, and I've been amazed at how our nation and our military continues to develop and rely on our space capabilities. It's been a great blessing to be part of Air Force Space Command, the Space and Missile Systems Center in Los Angeles, and programs like WGS. WGS is now a model acquisition program and breaking new ground by buying communication satellites more efficiently and affordably than ever before. I'm honored to be part of this outstanding team and help deliver space capabilities to make our country more secure. Well, Colonel Goldstein, thank you for that very insightful information. I'm sure it will be helpful to all of our viewers. My pleasure, Howard. This is Delta Mission Control at T plus 36 minutes and 35 seconds into the WGS-5 mission. Separation of the fifth wideband global SATCOM satellite is scheduled to occur approximately four minutes from now. Separation will occur over the east coast of Madagascar, approximately 50 degrees east longitude and 18 degrees south latitude. Let's join Steve Agate again for, final, for this final mission event. Passing 37 minutes, 7 seconds into the flight. We've uh, changed the settling jets, uh, ACS 9 and 11 being used now. Now approximately three minutes until payload separation. Passing 38 minutes into the flight.
passing 38 minutes, 38 seconds, about uh, two minutes until uh, spacecraft separation. Two jet uh, pairs, nine, correction, uh, nine and 11 have shut down and 10 or 12 are now active. We will uh, change the uh, settling jets along the thrust axis between nine, 11, 10 and 12 periodically. a minute and a half to go until spacecraft set. Coming on, on uh, 39 minutes, 30 seconds. Coming up on 40 minutes into the flight, Mark, 40 minutes, standing by for spacecraft separation. Standing by. And we have two good brick wires and spacecraft separation. Good spacecraft separation, WGS-5 now flying on its own. Colonel Goldstein, congratulations for the successful launch and the, and the separation of the WGS satellite for the United States Air Force. Thanks, Howard. Thanks, Howard. This is another important milestone for our warfighters, our nation, and our allies. Go Wideband. Go Wideband. And thank you again for your participation in today's LIDE coverage. Howard, it's my pleasure. It's an honor to represent the Air Force, Air Force Space Command, and the MILSATCOM Systems Directorate. I'd also like to, Steve, to thank Steve Agad for his contribution for today's broadcast. We'll conclude our live coverage with another look at today's liftoff. For more information about Delta IV, please go to www.ulalaunch.com. I'm Howard Voyan, and on behalf of the entire launch team, I want to I thank you for joining us and wish you a good evening. We have, lift off, we have RS-27 main engine. We have liftoff, the United Launch Alliance Delta IV rocket carrying WGS-5 for the United States Air Force. The wideband global SATCOM satellite provides significantly increased capacity to our nation's leaders, warfighters, and international partners. Looking good. You are hearing the, the voice of Steve Agad providing launch vehicle ascent data.